there's a thing in, in, in comedy and in writing called show don't tell. So if you could show them, it's more, it makes a bigger, bigger impact than, than telling them. But how do you show that other than just wait, wait a hundred years when there's no planet left, <laughs> right. then you'll know. Right. But how do you show in comedy? How do you show in comedy? You, you act out or you, you depict something rather than saying, I live in my mom's basement and that's funny. You say, you know, the other day my mom, Pat, came down to the basement, even though she's not allowed to without permission. <laughs> and so you show it without, without having to spoon feed them. And then they pat themselves on the back for getting it. I was recently in my special place. And it's not the basement. No, I was at the beach. And the sun was shining. And the waves uh, were crashing. And the wind was blowing. And I'm thinking, I'm always thinking, why do you think they call me mental? All right? I'm thinking, There's an energy crisis going on. All right? There's got to be some way that we could harness this solar energy and this tidal energy and this windular energy, I don't know what the word is, but you totally know what I mean. There's got to be some way that we could harness all of that power and put it into some kind of machine that will allow us to drill for more oil. <laughs> That's the juice that works. So you kind of lead them to come to the conclusion themselves. You lead them, yeah, you lead breadcrumbs and they, they make the conclusion. They think they make the conclusion themselves. But either way, if they make that conclusion, they're more likely to believe it, in my opinion, because right. why wouldn't they? I mm. figured this out myself. Right. And does comedy help you do that better? Or is there, is there a way to do that through comedy? Is there a way to do that through comedy? No, not necessarily. But is it just a story? As, as a comedian, that's what I use to get people to, to follow my train of thought. And I think in any other field, they could use the same techniques to get people to follow their thought instead of saying, hey, you're an idiot and you don't know this. This is true. You say, here's a piece of evidence. Here's a piece of evidence. Here's a piece of evidence. And it, as they get closer, they figure it out for themselves, even though you've, you've mm. led them the whole way. And then when they figure it out, they go, oh, this is what I figured out. So it's true because I, I mastered that rather than have someone spoon feed me or sell it to me or force it down my throat. We're, I mean, in a way, we're trying to do what you do, like, because climate change is a really serious topic and all the podcasts about climate change are really serious. Right? And, and but, I, but I noticed that what you're doing is you're taking a serious topic, but you're adding levity to it to, I guess, make it digestible for people. I, I certainly think it makes it more digestible when, when you can laugh at something, especially something that's, uh, that's intellectual. If you can add laughter to it, then it becomes emotional. And then it's a whole different part of your body processes it. So I think, and it's not just science that, that, that I talk about. Anything that's, that's in the brain, if you could add a laughter to it, and then all of a sudden it, be, it becomes part of the heart instead of the brain, and people digest that a different way. Or that's even, my theory. Or even the gut. I mean, I think. Or the uh, gut, yeah. Randy Olson talks about the different levels, so head, heart, gut, and groin. And the lower down you go, the um, what is the, the more effective it is. Like that's the lizard, so, well, the lizard you've got, brain. So you've got your intellectual science, then you've got emotion, then you've got humor, and then you've got sex appeal. So humor is, is third the on the list. Yeah. Right. <laughs> See, I try to do my humor up here where people figure it out, and then it's it's that aha rather than the, the ha-ha is one of the, the theories I've heard. So yeah. when you're writing or, you know, you're writing your routines – is there an approach you go, like, is there a structure to kind of lead people towards that aha moment? Uh, there are a number of different formulas or formulae, as they say, in your land. <laughs> Where are you? the, land the land of nerddom. The land of nerddom, <laughs> which we should all visit. Another, another take to the other camera there. Um, there, there yeah, there, there are some formulas, and you, you try to end with, you, you, you start wide and you end tight. You start with the generic and you end with the specific. And you end with the funny thing. So you lead people. It's a funnel. You start wide and you bring them into the tight thing. So when you write something, it's all gray and generic and then ends with, with black and white. So it's, it's crystal clear. And Can you give an example? No. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure there is one but i can't think of one right now but it, it i've been doing this so long that it's become ingrained so it becomes sort of a 
second nature. So I know how to, to write something um, so that it ends where I want them to end. I start with a really wide net and it pulls them in and I, I get a little bit more specific. And as it gets more specific, then the most specific thing becomes the funny thing that they can relate to because it paints the picture that much clearer. So I wouldn't say something like, Boy, that great job, scientists. I'd say, nice job, Einstein. And it, it paints a quicker picture. And that's the secret of, of, of comedy and, and any writing is you, you want to use as few words as possible to get to that final punchline with as little fat as possible. I have a lot of great ideas on how to solve global warming, but my ideas, some people don't listen to them because they're, they're, they go over people's heads so high, I'll actually see them roll their eyes upward to try to see my thoughts as they escape beyond their grasp of understanding. Here's how you can uh, solve global warming. Everybody needs to run their air conditioner all the time with their windows open. <laughs> it's a no-brainer, which is how I thought of it. All right, when you're hot, you turn on the air. When the planet's hot, doy, just turn on the air. What could be obviouser than that? I got the idea when I saw a cat go from the sun to the shade. Yeah, when hot, add cold. You'll be less hot. I don't know what part of this flow chart is tripping all you guys up. Even Mr. Pickles has it figured out, all right? It's not rocket surgery. It's a Bible. Okay? I was not at the show where he recorded oh you missed that was a great show i heard but I it heard was a really good great I, show probably I, the best show i heard I'm, i mean it was a great show but i right. think there was something good on tv that night so he couldn't make it right no i uh what was on tv that night a game was there I a game know. on there was I celebrity don't, apprentice I don't. oh that's a good one right and and you know i can't blame him for that because i think right. arnie needs all the support that he can get right right right, right. um but i i uh i liked uh there so I don't know. You guys have completely thrown my train of thought, but um, <laughs> uh, where was I going with this? You, something about the show. Co concrete, the, show. the comedy show, right? Comedy. But, 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 but something about the concrete detail. Are you thinking about one of the um, jokes? Yeah, yeah. I heard. Hottest, I heard the hottest year ever. Hottest no, July but we ever? can talk about that. I'll come back to it. I'm okay. sure. I would. But I just like we. You're really the, choking, Peter. Well, I'm Jeez. blowing this terribly. This is. Uh, this we is get a close up on that. They yeah. can zoom in on that. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll do it in post. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know. Well, we just the the whole con the idea of having concrete details. Um, like I guess I was maybe working up to the the seven hundred million thing when you're talking about like the uh, the dance class that you had to drive your niece to right right so or, and I just that was a very I mean it's a very specific detail. My niece is staying with us because none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> She said, Uncle Wobber, she said, from WobberMac.com. <laughs> she wanted to know about the story because the story, uh, North, uh, North America produced uh, uh, way too much energy, the energy, the more heat that was necessary, it shifts around the world. They had a, a heat wave in India, everyone turned on the air conditioners, they don't have a good infrastructure there. 700 million people lost power. And so uh, my niece wanted to know if 700 million is a lot. And I said, yeah, that's a lot. And I tried to explain it to her. I said, well, if you got all the people in Canada and you multiplied that by 20, you would have 700 million. <laughs> she doesn't know what Canada is. And I said, okay. <laughs> I said, remember that dance class last summer? And she said, yes. I said, you remember the one? It was really far away in that big dance studio. And we had to drive all the way out there and spend all that gas getting out there and then drive all the way back every day for two weeks. Do you remember? And she said, yes, I remember. And I said, okay, if you got the number of people who signed up for that class, you get that number and multiply it by 700 million. <laughs> you get 700 million. It has to be specific. Right. Specific sells it because right. people can picture that. If you say hot or big or tall, well, whatever, you know, that they, they can't process that or they, right. they can throw in their own. But if you give a number, 700 million or 150 degrees or something that they could rally around and then they have an image of, that is specific and real that they can see in their brain right and that's 
it's interesting because that's it's like that's a comedy thing but we in communication we're worried about like sticky like a sticky idea and all of the things that you're listing are like the things that make an idea sticky just generally. And what do you it's, mean sticky? I mean at the top of the list, sticky? Memorable. Like post is memorable. Sticky. memorable. So okay. Something that grabs people's attention and stays in there. Simple, memory. unexpected, concrete, right. credible, if emotional. If you're watching a show or, or surfing and, it's, and there's a factoid that pops up, Earth is getting hotter, no one's going to read that. But if right. it says Earth is getting hotter by 1.0067 degrees then it's it's more real it's more right. believable because it's a it's something that they can visualize yeah so i got a question um, yes i was at a climate communication workshop at a science conference climate years communication ago. workshop yeah yeah that's and, crazy to me right i know this there uh, but it's such an important thing that they say right. we've got to be able to convey this in a right. way that's clear i mean and understandable. The, the climate scientists have done all the science we need to know that we have to act now it's, they did it like 30 years ago right now it's a matter <laughs> of of uh, building public support and understanding of it and there was a scientist there from nasa um josh willis and we were just chatting and he said he was actually thinking about getting into stand-up comedy and i kind of pick my jaw up off the floor and i said to him i would rather face a room full of climate denialists than have to do a, like stand-up comedy in front of a room that seems like the scariest prospect ever is it really a scary prospect uh not at this point for me it's scary at first and it's that that is certainly a hurdle there's a, a big hurdle to get past if you're not comfortable in front of a crowd then that might not be a wise career choice but I got over that hurdle and I think a lot of guys do. You get over that hurdle quick and then then it's a whole slew of other things, you know, topics that I'm going to talk about and stage mannerisms and technique and all of that, but but speaking in front of a crowd is is sort of a make or break deal. So if yeah. you, if you can't deal with that then I mean, I can happily talk in front of a group about science, but but trying to make to, them laugh and have that expectation? Yes. That, yeah, that's a different thing and it, you, you get over that quick too. Would you would, sink or swim? If here's uh, this is a question I think a lot of people would wonder because people are scared to use humor in their talks. Like I think you probably use some uh, in yours. I do in mine a lot, and I, I do stand up comedy in my science talks. But it's <laughs> you a, do it's a homeopathic type of stand up comedy, like one joke every eight minutes. Okay, a tiny tiny little drop right. Of, yeah. of humor and that not, spreads yeah. out to the masses, and and is efficient. Yeah, but so I think people are worried about failing, and I I wondered if. What I think people's intuition is it's worse to try and fail to be funny than it is not to try at all. And I wonder your take on that. It's worse to try, try and, and fail. fail to be funny. That's worse than it, to just have a completely dry. No, I, would, I would say it's worse not to try. That's what I would think. Because a, a, a dry talk on climate change is going to be dry to begin with. And if you if you try a joke I don't think how that's going to lower the bar significantly. Right. I mean, how bad is that joke going right, to be right. for you to just throw up walking out going, right. ah, I tried to be funny in a serious talk. I'm out of here. No, I, I gave a talk at NASA about a month ago and I, oh. on the train over to the Goddard space flight center in Maryland, I thought of this great joke on the train. I thought uh, I'm going to test the, the one with all the, the rockets in the backyard. They kind of got, yep, yeah, yeah. I've, I've done a, a show there. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah, outside well, it was weird. You probably killed better than I did. Like I, I did this joke, and it just went down like a lead balloon. It was, it was murder, and I'll never be using that joke again. <laughs> and that I'm joke. Sure that and how long it. was your talk? Uh, it was an hour. An hour, and that joke was ten uh, seconds. It felt like an hour, but <laughs> <laughs> what? No, but seriously, yeah, it was a few seconds. A few seconds, and that's what you remember because because a joke that doesn't work sticks with you. But the as the, a speaker, but not as the a audience, speaker, right? So. As an audience, they're just they remember the last thing you said, so mm -hmm. uh, that didn't work. Whatever, what's next? And so, that's a tough thing when you're on stage as a performer. I will have a set that is 99 percent successful, but I'll always remember that guy in the front row in the red shirt who didn't laugh at that first joke about the whatever, <laughs> and because that's as you do this for a career, that becomes the the thing you focus on. Rather than the uh, 59 other minutes that worked, you're focused on the one minute that didn't work. And it might be a funny joke. You just don't, you're not a joke teller or a joke writer. And if you approached a joke person, they might be able to fix it for you. And so it would work. 
And then when you start your talk, oh, you get a laugh and they're engaged and now they're listening. So you don't have to play for 10 minutes to try to get their attention because the joke will do that for you. Hmm. But I like the polar bear joke. That wasn't in the set that he played for me. The polar there was bear something, joke. It was something about the zoo and it was like a swimming. It was, it was like a race joke about the brown bears and the polar bears. It was a good joke. That's a boat joke about bears, but some right, people right. think it's a joke about race. <laughs> some people Because do. I call them bears of color. Polar bears are extincting. Did you know that? <laughs> extincting. Yeah, why are you telling me? I just told you. Polar bears <laughs> are extincting. Glaciers are melting, and that's just the tip of an iceberg, something like that. The science guy <laughs> was talking really fast, but they're dying, and now the government says they're going to help, and I'm a little skeptical, because for years, black bears and bears of color have been hunted and killed for years. No one's done a thing about it, but the second that the polar bear is barely threatened... The White House drops everything. <laughs> knowing, knowing your audience and knowing what they know helps a lot when you're putting a set together. So speaking of that, when you, you do some, like you, you did the metric joke about like how that, that is immediate global cooling. Mm -hmm. What, how do you. Which was a great, that was probably yeah. my favorite joke in the whole Right, set. and if you're listening to this podcast now or watching, You'll have to look that up. No, no, we're going to cut it in. Oh, you're going to cut it yeah, in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great. To share my great ideas on how to lower temperatures around the world, here's another one, convert to the metric system. <laughs> we convert to the metric system, the temperatures will drop 50 degrees overnight. That's a scientific fact. Try it yourself tonight. Convert, drop 50 degrees, instant global cooling. <laughs> Well, they have the metric system in Sweden. It's never hot there. Is that magic? No, it's metric. Right. So, yeah. what'd you think of that? <laughs> okay. but so, how do you how do you decide what the background level of your audience? Do you do because you knew that set was going to be kind of sciencey themed? You felt oh, oh, totally. Yeah, if I know it's a science show, I can do anything with science. I will put that in there, and the science crowd will get it. And not only will they get it, they will appreciate it more because they know that we did those jokes for them and that's one of the things where they pat themselves on the right. back like other crowds might not get that but we got it and and that's what knowing knowing who's in your audience helps a lot yeah it sounds like audience self-affirmation is a huge part of like when you're saying like you know you kind of put the bread breadcrumbs out for them and they feel good and like I, I they're congratulating so. themselves on on getting like I like, I, I see that yeah, I don't yeah. know if an audience will admit that right no but but I, I get that sense when I hear that right. that laughter right that they're laughing because oh that's right. funny because I got it and not everyone in the room right, right is right. getting that it's like the whole thing where a politician or somebody will say that's a great question and like everybody says that and you're like that couldn't work. And then you do that to people. People do it to me. And I'm like, that was a great question. It was. It was I thought a great so. Question. That's why I asked it. I'm asking it because it was a good question. Yeah. <laughs> people like to to get that. that uh, Even if you know they're not being genuine, it's like, it, it But still in that feels moment, good. you believe it because politicians are charming. Yeah. And that was a great question. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually, I do recall now, you a couple of times through that night, like you would, you would make a comment about, but the people who got it. the joke help the people who didn't get the joke kind of thing? Because that happens. Because there's a, the, the, the people who are watching and getting it and the people who right next to them just, who what is he talking about? When it gets hot, do what I do. Take a summer vacation to Alaska. Yeah. Seven days, one night. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't everybody. Please explain that to the quiet people. <laughs> In science in particular, there's a lot of stuff that you know or you don't know. There's no middle ground where I kind of know it. It's yes or no. And someone in the audience might not get it. And imagine a regular comedy crowd at a comedy club and they're drunk and you can't talk about certain topics without someone having to explain, oh, that was a scientist. His name is Einstein. He's kind of famous for being smart. And so, when he, you know, so, so yeah, there's, there's that element on top of it. It seems like when you do that kind of extra level of explanation, 
you're not just picking up those people who didn't get it the first time. The people who got it the first time laugh again, maybe even harder. Yeah, yeah. There's there's certainly a an us and them thing in the audience of who yeah. gets it and who doesn't get it. And I like to try to pretend that I'm 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 supporting and and giving props to the people who got it because you guys are so smart for getting it and you're not that smart. But but if I say <laughs> you are, then you think you are. And then the people who aren't are trying to, oh, yeah. I get it. And so they laugh at something that that they're they're not sure they understand but they laugh at it anyway so they're part of the in crowd we're running a little late it would really help if you guys just got these all at the same time <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> someone around you doesn't look like they're getting it please explain it <laughs> do you find that writing science is different to writing comedy in other areas um Yes and no. It's different in that the subject matter is different. But um, but again, knowing the audience, if everyone in the audience is going to know science, then I can do a joke where when it's a science audience, I'll start with this joke. I'll say, I come from a large family, hominid. But a regular audience, we'll cut that in. A regular <laughs> audience, I'll say, I come from a large family, homo sapien. And it still works, but right, it's not. Right. It's it's not 100% right. accurate, but a science audience will know that it is. So knowing who's in the audience, if I'm in D.C., I can do a joke about the metro. Right. If I'm in Boise, Idaho, I can't. I'm like you guys. I'm doing my best to, to save the planet. I took uh, I took metro here tonight at uh, at night. I call it the comet because it feels like it comes once every 78 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to, once again know who is in the crowd and what they will respond to and if they're all science people then great i can do all of the science stuff and if not then i do material that sort of explains it and sets the table so that when i get to that punchline, they've been informed ahead of time how important is accuracy I, uh, it's important to be accurate i guess is it the more the more accurate and that the audience is, the, or the more precise the audience is, the more precise the material has to be. So Interesting. Yeah. if I'm doing a show about how old the earth is and I say it's a couple billion years old, that that may or may not fly in a regular audience, but in an audience of astronomers are going to want the numbers that they know. And so if they, if I don't say 4.5 billion years, they're going to get angry. And some of them will get angry when I say 4.5 billion, because well, our recent testing shows that it's 4.7 billion. So, um, so I try to be as accurate as possible. Then in, in the way comedy works is the premise is, is a truth. And then the punchline is something derived from that. So if, if the premise is off, then people who know that won't won't bother to follow through. Right. So if I say something like, you guys know what it's like when you wake up and your girlfriend is naked in bed with, and if that's not true, then most people in the room will be like, no, I don't, I don't <laughs> understand that because it's not true in their, in their field or their world. So being accurate is, is important. Yeah. So, and, and when, we have this kind of we so from a communication standpoint, there there are jokes in in your set that were very funny, but like they wouldn't send the message that we would want to send. So like like the like the hottest year joke. The science men said a couple of things uh, that I noticed. They said uh, they said generally at the end of every year they look at the figures and usually most of the time usually July is the hottest month of the year. And I thought back when I was a kid, Fourth of July. All right, always hot. All right, always July. So the evidence seems <laughs> to bear that out. July, hot. Okay, I get it. I'm not arguing with that. But then the next thing they said, they said July of last year was the hottest month on Earth ever. And that's a big thing to say because 
we're not done with ever yet. <laughs> it's a little early to be handing out trophies, all right? <laughs> Might not even be the hottest month of the decade, okay? Let's just see how it plays out, all right? <laughs> ever for the Earth began when the Earth began, which was 4.5 billion years and two and a half years ago. I've, I've done the research so you don't have to, and I talked to the specialists, and they've told me that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, and that was about two and a half years ago, so we <laughs> And the Earth will continue to exist for another five to seven billion years, minus the two and a half years <laughs> that have already transpired, <laughs> at which time the sun will turn into a red giant and consume the Earth. And so that, that stretch there is ever for the Earth. And we're not even halfway done. And you don't crown a champion before mid-season, all right? And I, I'm no gambling guy, but if I were, I'd put all my money on probably the last month of ever. I bet you it's going to be kind of hot. Sun expands 250 times its size and turns into a 5,000 degree ball of nuclear fusion, vaporizing every atomic bomb that holds the Earth's very existence together. That's got to be hotter than July. I think. <laughs> Today's forecast continue dry and hot, but eventually giving way to eternal nothingness. <laughs> and the reason that joke to me is funny is because somebody said this is the hottest year ever. Right. And they've used the word ever in a way that I would not use it. Right. And right. that is that is where I find the humor. That is right. where the joke derails. Right. Um, and that's a communication issue with yeah. with scientists. Well, and it's not I mean, for us it's like that if you compare the heat death of the planet to global warming, the heat death of the planet's worse. So like to try to get people concerned about global warming. It, you're like that's a worse thing so like you're you're kind of big footing the like from our perspective so we couldn't use that joke but it's a better joke so when you're like when because, you're because the thing i'm talking about is is a different issue that's a more well and it's like it's a lot more heat i mean you're, it'll vaporize the planet like that is like it's that's more warming it will be hotter like at the end the right. last day of earth will right. be hotter than right. it is today so like the and the question that you know we would be faced with the choice of kind of sacrificing humor for the fact for the or or for the for the communication message you're trying to convey whereas uh, uh, okay. I would assume for you if you're given the choice between like climate change is a serious issue but this is a better joke like you go with the better joke because, I go with the better right, joke because right. I'm a joke teller right, right. right. and do you feel and, like there's tension though ever in it? Do you ever get to a topic and it doesn't have to be science where that's a choice you have to make? That's a good question. I would have to think about that. Uh, I, I've never thought about that because for me, one of the, one of the secret ingredients of comedy is exaggeration. If you can exaggerate something to show why it's bigger or different or, I mean, exaggeration is that tool that you would use to show that it's getting hotter. So, um, so I would, in a science show, I would do that joke because in my brain, that is how hot things are getting. Whereas someone in the front row with the slide rule in his pocket is going to say, well, actually that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the 0. 0.2 degrees right. that it's going to be hotter. That is, um, I didn't answer that question, No, but, that's I'm, but I'm going to stick with that non-answer. <laughs> okay. I do not have an answer for that yeah. question. No, I've never, I never thought of that. No, I go with what's funny to me, right. Right. and and what's funny to me is more important than well, what is what is this guy going to think is funny? No, right. I'm 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 relaying what I find humorous. I guess we feel like I mean we love the idea of using comedy to to enhance our science communication, but we also feel like we're in this. I, that's a bad analogy, but like this straitjacket of having to mm -hmm. never mislead or exaggerate right. in order to make sure that everything we say is completely accurate. Oh, yeah, I can see that now. And so that's why you would hire comedians and then put the blame on them. For <laughs> that's a great yes. idea. That's um, a great idea. Yeah. We just outsource all the... Um, uh, yeah. And then when they go, 
you can just point to the comedian right, and go, right. that guy was lying. It's not that <laughs> get bad. Him, get him. Yeah. That's why he's only a comedian right. and I'm the scientist and I have the true facts. Well, but, like Josh, but exaggeration right. is a great tool in comedy. There's a couple of tools or secrets or formulas there's a rule of three. You've probably right. heard jokes yeah. where the first guy did and the second guy, but the third guy, it's always one, two, three, and exaggeration's another one. You blow something up so people can see how stupid or absurd or crazy or racist or whatever you're talking about, how much of that it is by expanding it and making it unbelievable. But as a scientist, you can't exaggerate because that's not the nature of your your line of work. Uh, then yeah, hire a comedian. Yeah. Hmm. What about dark humor? Like that, I mean, that's particularly suitable for climate change. For what? Dark humor. Dark humor. Gallows humor. Uh, do you not use the term dark humor in? It the, just I, sounds you like you're saying either duck humor, yes, or like was, you're about to say document or documentary, and you're I just thought, not I finishing. thought you were saying another word, and yeah. it's probably because I have we're this. foreigners <laughs> from where you are. But for us, I don't <laughs> think other Australians <laughs> speak this way. Truthfully, that's my hypothesis. The Lord <laughs> works in mysterious ways. All right, He makes animals, and those animals die and become fossils, and those fossils become fossil fuels, and those fossil fuels kill other animals. That's how God <laughs> That's how God recycles. Dark humor is weird. It's uh it's mostly unknown. 94% of the galaxy is dark humor. <laughs> and dark humor matters. Oh. Uh, dark matter matters. Anyway, the point <laughs> the point is I do a lot of uh I do a lot of shows that are not in comedy clubs in in non-comedy settings so at a corporate event or 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 at a science auditorium like i did it for the aaas people and sometimes really dark stuff is just as off-putting as vulgar stuff hmm. sometimes they just go oh that's no we came to laugh and have a good time and they don't realize that that when you when you tell a comedian don't do any dirty or foul or or f-bombs or any vulgar things we go yeah okay but in our head we can still do something dark but they're thinking they're, they're not thinking that and so a dark joke can come off as really really negative and and turn a, an audience i noticed a, a few moments amongst several of the comedians at the at the comedy night where there was some dark stuff and the audience kind of reacted and the how did they react? I didn't I don't remember. Just kind of a ooh, ooh we of, didn't we didn't expect that. Yeah. yeah, we were expecting all jokey jokes and not because dark stuff can be very very depressing. Right. I, I think you talked at one point about how um oil can help with overpopulation issues or Yeah, or, yeah, <laughs> love makes the world go round but hate makes it less crowded. Oil is the most energy efficient renewable resource we have on the planet. Everybody knows it. All right, love makes the world go around, but oil makes the world go around uh, more smoothly. And wars over oil make the world less crowded. So, too dark on that one. That's funny to me, but uh, if you're if I'm doing a show at a church event and everyone's in a different state of mind, that it hits them unexpected and and yeah you have to really know again know your audience and 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 what they're looking for and what they're expecting so is dark humor kind of sort of a it's it's something that very easy to cross a line or but 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 if you can do it right or if you, if the situation is right then you can get a lot of benefit from it is it high risk high reward um to be honest i i haven't i don't I don't write my jokes and go, okay, I'm, I'm writing regular jokes and now I'm going to write a dark joke. It's just one of the flavors of, of what comes out of my pen. Do you and like the way we're kind of putting everything through the science meter? Or no, like no, no, no. <laughs> that's interesting. I mean, that's, that's how you look at the world. And, and, and I look at the world through writing jokes. And so we're, we're, we're in that little Venn overlap area. And, uh, but I don't write jokes going, okay, I need a dark joke right. now. And how's this dark joke going to play out? It's just, this is funny to me. And I tell it and an audience will go, ooh, ooh, or they'll laugh. And and then I realize, oh, that was probably inappropriate or not right for this room or this time or this set or or whatever. But I would say overall dark stuff would work at a club, but it wouldn't work at a science convention as much as it would at a club. 